So this might be a controversial one. After breaking down the anime's opening episodes, as well as its first side arc with Fuko route, I was expecting another standard side arc in the anime as it moves into Katomi's route. But playing through the VN for the first time, I was surprised to find a story that was anything but standard. Katomi's route not only includes content the anime pulls from for its entire run, it's an absolute highlight of the VN, with some of my favorite character writing of the entire game, and is rich with thematic and character development. And my hot take for this episode is that this time, the anime cuts out too much, rushes through the content too fast, and loses out on a lot of the magic I was surprised to discover in the VN. Sure, it hits the major plot points, but is it worth it if the meaning behind those moments is so stripped away? I'll attempt to answer that question, but first let's quickly go over how, even in the VN, Katomi route is weird. As a refresher, so far the anime has covered the start of Nagisa route before switching into Fuko's arc for five episodes. This is a sensical choice, since Fuko's VN route also happens to split off midway through Nagisa's. Katomi's, however, functions the same way as most of Clan Ed's other routes, with its plot branching off basically right at the start. And unlike with Nagisa, the player literally never sees Katomi unless you select the choice that leads Okazaki down her route, namely visiting the school library. While Nagisa, Tomoya, and the Fujibayashis all make side or at least cameo appearances in other routes, Katomi gets nary a mention outside her route, a distinction shared only by Yukane and Kape. Even her inclusion in the bonus baseball route is unique to the anime, with her role being played by Fuko in the VN. But by contrast, her route in the VN is the only one where the main cast actually hangs out and forms a friend group. As we'll see in my next video, Nagisa's VN route has only herself, Okazaki, and Sunahara involved in the reformation of the drama club, while the anime already has, and will continue to, include the other girls in the day-to-day -day shenanigans. This edition is arguably one of the anime's best changes, adding life to originally sparsely populated routes, and it feels like an archaeological discovery to realize its origin was actually from Katomi's VN route. So that covers Katomi route's contributions to the wider anime. But why do they also claim that her route was such a gem in the VN, and why do I think the anime, for the first time, fails to reach up to the same standards? Well, to cover that, we'll have to dive into the comparison, and go all the way back to the start. As mentioned, following Fuku's route in the VN, we can only begin Katomi's by returning back to the title screen. We then play through a collection of incidents discussed in Common Route, meeting Nagisa at the foot of the hill, talking to her about the drama club, and crucially choosing to skip class where Okazaki first runs into Katomi. This first meeting also occurs all the way back in episode 2 of the anime, back when it was also working its way through all the initial Common Route introductions. But before we return to that meeting, let's cover how the anime is planning to move on from the conclusion of Fuko Route. Episode 10, the first following Fuko Route, appropriately begins with a montage of our cast traveling to school, returning us back to the wider status quo after the Fuko focus of the last few episodes. We then get a moment I've repeatedly criticized the anime for cutting, Nagisa waiting for Okazaki at the foot of the hill so they can walk to school together. As mentioned in my first video, this is a regular occurrence early on in Nagisa and Okazaki's relationship in the VN, and helps set up their unique dynamic and build their relationship before diving into plot shenanigans. This series of meetings was entirely skipped over in the anime, and to further twist the knife, Okazaki appears surprised seeing Nagisa here, confirming the cut meetings weren't even happening off screen. At least it's a nice reference, but instead of using it to build their relationship, we see the anime setting up for Katomi's reintroduction, with Okazaki wondering if he should ask her as they discuss their lack of drama club signups. This conversation is then cut short by Kyo attempting to murder our main character via motorbike, followed by Okazaki failing to elicit her sympathies by pretending to be seriously injured. This sequence of events also occurs in the VN, but in a totally different place, and Nagisa's inclusion in the anime causes the incident to instead turn to Kyo teasing Nagisa for her concern and for the familiar tone Okazaki uses with her. This leads to an anime-only flashback to Fuko, as in the anime's continuity, Fuko had previously convinced Okazaki to call Nagisa by her first name. The couple can't exactly remember Fuko or what happened, but Nagisa notes it's a warm memory. Of course, this sort of callback isn't needed in the VN, where after finishing Fuko route, the continuity restarts from scratch, but it's a nice addition to smooth the transition between what were originally unrelated storylines. And with that diversion finished, the pair returns to school and Katomi route properly kicks off in the anime, or it will after we circle back to discussing her initial introduction. Both the VN and anime begin with Common Route, an intro portion of the VN where Okazaki can meet the various casts without committing to any one route. For Katomi, this means choosing to skip class at one of a couple opportunities, leading to Okazaki entering the school library to bum a nap and meeting her. The anime introduces Katomi similarly, adding some additional context as Okazaki initially wonders if she's the ghostly girl he'd been hearing rumors about, a girl who of course ultimately ends up being Fuko. In both versions, Katomi is sat on the floor of the empty library reading, before she reveals scissors and prepares to snip a page from the library book. We are then reintroduced to the difference between Okazaki's VN and anime personalities as VN Tomoya watches on bemused while his anime counterpart steps in and stops this strange girl from defacing the defenseless library book. In both cases, Katomi reacts unexpectedly and suddenly offers Okazaki part of her lunch, something you can turn down in the VN to cut her out short. Otherwise, like in the anime, Okazaki is confused but obliges the free food, also noting the books around Katomi are all complicated text. Food mooched, Okazaki turns to leave, with Katomi sending him off with, See you tomorrow. Awfully confident words, verging on threatening, to direct at a total stranger but will make sense once we get to this route's big, forgotten childhood friend plot point. Again cognizant of the small details, the anime changes Katomi's line to a much less interesting see you later, assumedly done to make Okazaki seem less cruel for dishing Katomi after this meeting for all of Fuko route, but it does make Katomi's comment markedly less interesting. 
The anime then continues with its own content by cutting to Ryo explaining that she must have been Kotomi Ichinose, the school's resident genius, details Vienno Katsuki doesn't learn until their second meeting. Again, I assume this was moved sooner so that the strange girl doesn't remain unintroduced for a full arc and a half after her first appearance. The pair's next mini is a little less similar between versions, with the anime reincorporating her into Nagisa route episode 4, as Okazuki swings by when looking for potential drama club recruits. She's entirely absorbed in her reading, refusing to respond unless Okazuki calls her Kotomi-chan, a quirk also present in the VN made weirder in the anime given that Kotomi hasn't instructed Okazuki to refer to her as such by this point. Speaking of, not much happens here except for them swapping introductions, Kotomi offering books and food, and an anime-only edition of Okazuki asking her to consider joining the drama club. The V inversion isn't a ton more impactful, but the setup's different, with Okazuki again having the choice to skip class and run into, uh, Kotomi? Yeah, that's right, Ryo just cockblocked us from progressing Kotomi's route. For some inexplicable reason, Ro will prevent Okazuki from skipping class the second time, forever locking us out of Kotomi's route, unless we previously chose to ignore her instead of apologizing. Having inevitably consulted a guide to figure this out, we can go back in time to the second choice of the entire game and be a dick to Ro so that we can properly ditch class, whereupon Okazuki runs into Kotomi also wandering the halls. He follows her back to the library where Kotomi sets up space on the floor to read, while Okazuki eventually falls asleep, before he finally asks Kotomi's name and properly introduces himself. We also get introduced to one of Kotomi's reoccurring behaviors here, barely adapted in the anime, where she insists on splitting her food half-seas with Tomoya. The VN piles on some foreshadowing, something the anime skips over entirely, showing Kotomi's surprise by Okazuki asking her name, as well as Okazuki thinking to himself that something about the situation is vaguely familiar, a thought easier expressed in the VN given that it's written from his first-person point of view. And, if for some reason you're not familiar with Kotomi's route yet, this is all pointing to the reveal that Okazuki and Kotomi were once childhood friends, a fact only Okazuki has forgotten. Replaying the VN, it becomes clear Kotomi is written with this clearly in mind, with many of her actions making a lot more sense when you consider that she recognizes Okazuki and of course assumes he remembers her as well. It's a neat subversion of her expectations, since both Okazuki and the audience initially write off her comments as due to her being weird or quirky, while objectively it's Okazuki who's making the strange comments by acting like they've never met before. Unfortunately, the anime doesn't seem to think this recontextualized foreshadowing is as cool as I did, as it's almost removed entirely. Not only does this make the route's plot twist less impactful, it also highlights a lack of interest the anime seems to have in Kotomi's perspective. For instance, the anime removes a later scene showing Kotomi and Okazuki always splitting their food half seas as kids, meaning her offering Okazuki food during their first meeting is never recontextualized, and even after learning the plot twist, we can still only interpret it as her being weird in the anime. And speaking of quirks, this is also the point where, like with Ro, you'll be ignominiously locked out of this route in the VN if you haven't selected the right choices with other characters. In this case, if you didn't at least meet up with Nagisa once, Okazuki will suddenly realize he's developed commitment issues and will flake out on Kotomi as well. The plot reason for this requirement will soon be clear, as the existence of the drama club ends up weaving its way back into Kotomi's route, but like with Ro's interruption, this represents another bad ending that you can hit without any foreshadowing and only the vaguest hints as to where you actually messed up. But that first conversation about the drama club is actually all that's required in the VN. At this point, Okazuki can either be actively helping Nagisa restore the drama club or just vibing on his own after their first conversation. The former scenario is similar to the anime setup, but it also presents one of the VN's cruelest choices. At the end of Okazuki's next meeting with Kotomi, you're forced to choose who to ditch and who to keep eating lunch with. In effect, forcing Okazuki to tell one of the socially awkward friendless girls he doesn't want to hang out with them anymore. Dichi Nagisa is arguably the nicer option, since you still visit her after school to help with the drama club and she soon rejoins the narrative of Kotomi's route. But ditching Kotomi here seems incredibly cruel in retrospect, with her one long-lost childhood friend finally reappearing only to once again walk out of her life. In fact, plenty of Clan Ed's characters have admittedly depressing fates during the VN timelines where Okazuki doesn't interact with them, a scenario the anime fortunately avoids as Okazuki is able to weave through the narrative and fix everyone's problems in turn. This change does give us a cute added Kotomi meeting in the middle of Fuka route, where Okazuki brings Fuka to the library to invite Kotomi to her sister's wedding, and the two bond over starfish facts, a particularly unique interaction since, to my knowledge, the two characters never have an opportunity to meet in the VN. But enough with the tangents and quick meetings, the anime finally kicks off Kotomi's route in full with its adaptation of the VN's third meeting. In both cases, this begins with Okazuki and Tsunohara in the hallway, and the VN due to them both ditching class, while the anime has Tsuno focused on simping over Nagisa, a cursed holdover from Fuka route. In either case, Okazuki lures Tsuno into the library with the promise of a beautiful reclusive girl waiting for him, turning him to a manic looney tune as he runs into the library as overheard smashing the place up, before he returns to report back that despite literally knocking over bookshelves, he couldn't get Kotomi to stop reading and notice him. This is also where Suno tells Okazuki of Kotomi's genius status in the VN, a detail Ro mentioned after his first meeting in the anime, with the VN additionally adding that her test scores are consistently top 10 in the nation, and that the teachers let her basically do her own thing as long as the scores stay high. In both versions, Suno then leaves and Okazuki enters the library, only able to get Kotomi's attention by calling her Kotomi-chan, a gag the anime has already used a couple times at this point. In both cases, she chides Okazuki for the destruction Suno wrought on the library as she perfectly returns each scattered book to its correct spot. In the anime, this moves on to Okazuki inviting Kotomi to the drama club, while in the VN we have the usual exchange of offered food and Kotomi wanting to split everything half-seas, before Okazuki offers to bring some cafeteria bread next time so he isn't entirely mooching off her. 
The Vian continues to foreshadow Okazaki and Kotomi's existing relationship, with Okazaki again noting a strange feeling of both familiarity and guilt as Kotomi first speaks the route's arc words, seemingly randomly quoting book lines at Tomoya. The anime keeps these lines and has Kotomi quote them at Okazaki at a much later meeting, but ultimately cuts most of the context that gives them meaning. I didn't even realize it until doing this analysis, but Kotomi bringing up these lines here seems to be her testing Okazaki, seeing if he truly has forgotten her without tipping him off to her intentions. An action substantiates her comments in the route's climax that she only slowly recognized Okazaki had forgotten her and became afraid of him remembering. As mentioned, this is also where the player has to decide to either continue Nagito's route or switch to Kotomi's if he continued helping the drama club. By the way, that's the end of this meeting in the VN, while in the anime we immediately skip to Okazaki bringing Kotomi to the drama club room. This transition is actually the result of the anime switching the order of the next two major encounters, Okazaki meeting Kotomi in a bookshop outside school, and Kotomi's introduction to the drama club, which in the VN happens the following week. In the VN series of events, Okazaki again runs into Kotomi after leaving school, seeing her enter a bookstore. This time Okazaki does stop her from cutting a page out of a book in both versions, with the VN adding an explanation by Kotomi that she regularly goes on multi-bookstore shopping sprees, buying everything from science to cookbooks. The anime cuts out this detail, but also skips over the next couple much more plot-relevant discussions. This isn't necessarily clear when first playing through the route, but VN Kotomi's disposition towards Okazaki seems to take a significant turn here, as Okazaki predicates some of his anti-book vandalism advice by stating he's just a stranger, a comment that causes Kotomi visible confusion. Then, as they leave for home, Kotomi is suspiciously insistent about not having Okazaki accompany her to her house, a position that in retrospect is a reaction to Okazaki's prior comment. This meeting seems to be where Vian and Kotomi finally understands that Okazaki has forgotten her, and we can now see her begin to act more outwardly normal from here on out as she seems to go along with Okazaki's notion that this is their first time meeting. Her intentionally preventing Okazaki from seeing her house throughout the rest of the route, even later on when they're dating and walking home most of the way holding hands, again gives credence to her later comment saying that she wasn't sure if she wanted him to remember, correctly identifying that Okazaki returning to her house could trigger his forgotten childhood memories. As you should now come to expect, all this juicy characterization and cool retroactive context is removed in the anime's rendition. The VN then follows the scene up with a much less impactful cut sequence, where as they depart, Katomi continues to tell Okazaki, see you tomorrow, despite the next day being a holiday, a promise that's surprisingly fulfilled is while aimlessly bumming around, Okazaki finds himself at school and runs into Katomi. They enter the library, with Katomi explaining she was previously given a key as an honorary library assistant due to her frequent visits. You have the option to have Okazaki read alongside her, but he gives up and falls asleep regardless, getting vague childhood flashbacks to Katomi's house on fire that the anime does eventually adapt, but again lessens the foreshadowing value of by pushing it back until far later in the route. Upon returning to school the next day, Vian Okazaki begins to execute on a plan to catch back up with the anime, grabbing Nagisa before class and telling her to go to the drama club after school. He then eats lunch with Kotomi, who brought enough food for two to spite Okazaki fulfilling his promise of bringing cafeteria bread, with Kotomi continuing to insist they split both her food and the bread equally. Now caught up with the anime, Okazaki brings Kotomi to the drama club room after school, where Nagisa soon enters. In both versions we get a god-tier Nagisa moment where socially awkward Kotomi can only introduce herself by listing out each of her characteristics and favorite things one by one, a pattern Nagisa immediately identifies and responds in turn with zero hesitation. Okazaki cuts this back and forth short, before he has to forcefully remind Nagisa she should be attempting to recruit Kotomi, a motivation the VN briefly uses here as well. In both versions, Okazaki can also reference back to Nagisa's recruitment speech he helped her practice, which is a cool way to help bridge the plot lines. Nagisa also catches Okazaki up on the drama club's progress in the VN, which differs depending on when you ditched her for Kotomi. This can range from Nagisa having to explain the entire context of the drama club being shut down and her attempting to revive it to just telling Okazaki about the club posters being taken down. Even in the prior case, where Okazaki has only talked with Nagisa twice, he makes a rare VN nice guy move and is about to confront the student council before Nagisa stops him, saying she needs more practice anyways before the club can be reinstated. Okazaki notices a confidence in her voice that wasn't there before and relents to leave the matter to her. As a side note, Nagisa's characterization here is a VN only gem, and it's cool to see the two of them interacting in this route as just friends without the romantic undercurrent. We see that Nagisa was able to overcome her disappointment towards the drama club's closure and start taking steps towards rebuilding it even without Okazaki's constant help, and there's an admirable strength to her lonesome perseverance, even if it's ultimately futile in this timeline. It's an interesting perspective only possible due to the VN's multiple timelines, and it's refreshing to see Nagisa wouldn't have been totally helpless without Okazaki's constant support. But despite Kotomi turning down Nagisa's invitation, the two bond, especially after Kotomi sees a recruitment poster and expresses that she also likes Sadango Daikazuku. Okazaki then walks home with Kotomi in both versions, a somewhat weird moment in the anime due to his existing relationship with Nagisa, whereupon Kotomi hits Okazaki with the big question, is Nagisa his lover? Vian Okazaki notes it's a surprisingly mature question despite Kotomi's otherwise unaware personality, and you have the option to tease her about it, but in both versions Okazaki ultimately denies the accusation. Anime Okazaki additionally comments she's acting just like Kyo did earlier, a nice setup for her upcoming reintroduction into Kotomi route. In the anime, Kotomi then mentions wanting to stop by a bookstore on the way home, and we get a much abridged version of their Vian visit. The next day in the VN, Okazaki dishes class to meet Kotomi, but is caught by a teacher this time and forced to run for it. During lunch, Okazaki discusses a plan to help Kotomi make 100 friends, a seemingly common ambition in Japan, and helps her practice her comedy routine. 
Botan then reappears at school, an occurrence common to multiple routes will break down when the anime gets to it, which in this case is used to transition to Okazuki introducing Kyo to Katomi as a potential new friend. This is also where the anime picks back up, with our resident recluse understandably frightened by Kyo in both versions, shivering and asking if she's a bully after witnessing her demeanor towards Okazuki. The anime also adds Kyo rightfully calling Okazuki out for ditching Nagus in the drama club to help this random girl, as well as complaining under her breath that a new rival has appeared. She then goes off on Okazuki in both versions about how you can't force friendships, but introduces herself to Katomi as she leaves. In proper montage format, the anime skips right to their friendship attempt with Ro, but the VN of course is a couple days in between, including the next day where Katomi is suspiciously absent after school, even after a school announcement calls her to the office. This is such a major moment in the route I'd gas at myself into remembering it in the anime as well, but nope. Vian Okazuki eventually goes to the office, where a teacher explains Katomi never showed up and that a similar scenario has occurred a couple times in the past, before Okazuki bullies Tsunahara and they go home. The next day in the VN, Okazuki finds himself under the watchful gaze of his teacher, preventing him from skipping and causing him to worry about whether Katomi's okay, only for Katomi herself to break through his thoughts and apologize for missing their meeting yesterday, but suspiciously gives no explanation as to why she didn't show up. Ro then chooses herself as their friendship target for the day as she chases Okazuki down to return his bag, which he had apparently forgotten when he left with Katomi. The anime instead only has a quick interlude in the library between Kyo and Ro's meetings, where they discuss Katomi's comedy routine in a moment taken from right before the friendship attempt started in the VN. Ryo's scene also has some interesting changes. In both cases, her and Katomi stand silently, neither making a move. The anime uses some nice visual cues to show this is due to Ryo's disappointment seeing Okazuki so close with yet another girl, and she gains some positive character points by walling in her disappointment for just a beat before proactively reaching out to Katomi by offering to tell her fortune. This sad jealousy is a dynamic present in the VN as well, but it doesn't seem to be the case here, with the VN depicting the meeting as much more of a straightforward shy-off, with neither a socially awkward girl knowing what to say to a complete stranger. Like in the anime, Ryo kicks things off with some fortune telling, after a VN exclusive fumbling of the cards, and unfortunately predicts Katomi will make no friends tomorrow. Despite this seemingly confirming Katomi's suspicion that she, like her sister, is a bully, she does agree to be Katomi's friend. One down, 97 more to go. Katomi and Okazuki's next discussion in both versions involves coming up with a standardized introduction script she can use. In the VN, this explicitly takes place on the next day, while in the anime, Okazuki mentions creating a script they can use on their next break, which makes me wonder if all these meetings are supposed to take place in a single day in the anime. Is this just a case of the anime having no real day-to-day -day consistency, or are we supposed to believe that anime Okazuki just goes to one of those mythical anime schools where no classes ever take place, just passing period and lunch? And speaking of odd occurrences, Katomi's next meeting is an anime-exclusive run-in with Tomoyo. She's once again wearing a bear suit, like at the Founders Festival, but this time there's not really a good excuse as to why. She remains silent for some reason, but even under the outfit you can tell she's in solidarity with Kyo, incredulous Okazuki found yet another girl to follow around helping. Given all the other foreshadowing the anime cut out, you might be surprised that it at least tries to add some here, although it bungles the execution. Seeing Tomoyo's costume, Katomi hugs onto the bear, seeing how much she loves teddy bears. This, at first glance, seems to be some added foreshadowing to the route's conclusion, which revolves around Katomi finally receiving a stuffed bear she asked her parents for when she was a child, just before they left on a flight and never returned. But in that case, her reaction doesn't make sense here, right? Even in the anime, Katomi's childhood flashback includes her admitting she didn't care about the stuffed bear and just requested whatever gift was popular with other girls her age. And given she never received the teddy bear due to her parents uh, dying, it doesn't make sense that she'd have positive connotations with them at this point. Honestly, my crack theory is that the anime's timeline was different at some point in pre-production, with Katomi route being adapted before the Founders Festival, and this was supposed to be a cute callback to a route that never got cut. Maybe that's an insane theory, but given that the anime has otherwise shown itself capable of inserting route-spanning foreshadowing, my only other explanation is that the writers just hate Katomi so much that they weren't satisfied by tearing out all the Vian's foreshadowing, only able to continue their crusade by adding intentionally bad foreshadowing to her route. But to prevent myself from ranting further about an otherwise inconsequential scene, let's move on, after Sunahara appears and fails to get revenge on the bear for the beating he received during Fuko's route, of course. We then meet Katomi's next friend. Who else but the school lunch lady? We've seen her a couple times in the VN when Okazuki bought bread on his way to the library, but this is her first time meeting Katomi. Nothing if not consistent, Katomi hits the lunch lady with her friend script, and they have some pleasant banter, before she mentions that Katomi's parents are famous scholars, but Katomi only gives vague answers when Okazuki asks her about it later. We then get another moment in the VN showing Katomi isn't as socially unaware as she initially appears, as she expresses concern for Okazuki constantly skipping class to meet her, and they decide to only share lunch on Fridays. We then get a VN-only friend introduction as Sunahara runs into Katomi and Okazuki walking back from lunch, completely confused to see the pair together, something that isn't helped when Katomi immediately pulls her practice friend script on him. VN Okazuki then continues his unrelenting bullying, convincing Sunahara that he's dreaming and leading to him slamming his head into the wall so hard he knocks himself out. And this is the friendship we have an entire route celebrating? But in both versions, the pair is next set upon by a vicious predator. As Kyo appears and in the VN does that thing where sexual assault is somehow funny when perpetrated by someone of the same sex, a moment the anime fortunately tones down to some much less extreme skinship, before roping Okazuki into taking her, Katomi, and Ro on a fun date. We of course smash cut to the drama club room, much to Kyo's dismay, with her even suggesting in the VN that Okazuki should have taken them to that theme park with the giant mouse mascot. 
Not yet being acquainted with Nagisa and the Vien, Ryo wonders if they should even be in the club room, before Nagisa opens the door and immediately 180s, convinced she entered the wrong club room. Ohazuki admonishes her for needing some backbone as a club president, while in the anime Kyo explicitly whispers to her sister that she set this up as a chance for her to get closer to Okazuki. In either case, Kotomi interrupts by hitting them all with her friend script, and the girls each respond with their own version. Even Kyo gets blowed into it, but lashes out at Okazuki, which turns into a somewhat surreal example of comedic timing for Kotomi. Especially in the VM, we can already see a dynamic forming of the airheaded Kotomi, Ro, and Nagisa contrasted by the cynical Okazuki and Kyo watching on the sidelines, a dynamic less present in the anime due to Nagisa and Okazuki's deeper pre-existing relationship. The Vian group plays with a prop wand, and Kotomi attempts to recite the deep magic before the entire group's pivots to doing an improv skit about Okazuki trying to sell Kotomi as a home accessory, a sequence that ironically highlights that their club president has the least natural acting talents. In the Vian, they then leave to walk home, proposing to eat lunch together from then on. In another example of adherence to consistency, Kotomi then tells each one of them, see you tomorrow, in turn, before continuing towards home with Okazuki, much to the twins' suspicion. The anime instead has the twins brush off Nagisa's initial invitation to the drama club as an excuse to why we can't proceed with her route, and they make a half-hearted excuse to still hang out in the drama room so Kotomi can learn jokes or something. At least we get another phenomenally communicated character moment as Kyo looks on exasperated her sister hanging out with Kotomi and Nagisa instead of with Okazuki, before sighing to herself that it's fine when she sees how much Ryo is still enjoying herself. It's a sentiment she also expresses later in the VN, but this moment is a great example of the anime using its visual medium to show the same emotion, instead of requiring Kyo to say it outright. In the anime, the group is then distracted by the distant sound of a violin, an occurrence that happens during their next meeting in the VN, which of course has an additional day's worth of filler in between. This includes Okazuki meeting Nagisa in the cafeteria the next day to buy bread, only to learn Kotomi brought an entire New Year's feast worth of food for the entire group, as well as Kyo nearly winning a poker hand by pure, unadulterated bluffing. In the VN, they then meet in the club room after school in a sequence the anime also adapts later, with Okazuki entering the club room to find Kyo drilling Kotomi through reps of some punchline only funny in Japanese, her repeated humorously cut in between Kyo and Okazuki's lines in both versions. The rest of the group enters, and Nagisa again proves her superiority by mirroring the joke right back at Kotomi with zero hesitation. The VN even noting her immediate mastery of the retort timing causes Kotomi to deflate slightly. Okazuki then leaves to buy drinks in the VN, noting he must have mellowed out since he's actually enjoying himself in this mismatched company, an interesting moment of self-reflection he also makes during After Story. It's as he returns in the VN that the sound of violin music wafts into the club room and Kotomi suddenly makes a break for the source, rejoining us with the anime series of events. Chad, Vian, and Kotomi burst into the room and immediately drops a bad joke, freezing the three second-year girls inside speechless. In the VN, Okazuki additionally notes the intimidation factor a bunch of third-year students bursting into their classroom is having on the underclassmen, since as we all know, Japanese high schools apparently operate as strict hierarchical dictatorships. The second-year girls, who also end up playing a role in Nagisa's route, explain in the VN that they're at the choir club, but were testing out one of the school's old violins to see if it was still playable. The anime instead skips directly to the violin's player, Nishina, offering Kotomi a try, leading to banned by the Jin the convention levels of destruction. The anime episode then ends with a random cut to Old Stake. Not sure why, Kyoni must have just been big fans of MGS4 or something. While in the VN, we see Nishin loan the violin to Kotomi before the group walks home, all of them traumatized by Kotomi's playing, but Ryo and Nagisa noting she looks so happy when playing they just couldn't object. Only Okazuki and Kyo remain cynical. The VN then cuts to the weekend, and you're given the choice to lounge around at home or wander about, the latter choice leading Okazuki to hear strange noises emanating from school. He investigates and, of course, finds Kotomi practicing violin in the library. This same setup is used later in the anime, but in this case, Okazuki just leaves her to practice uninterrupted. We also see some further self-reflection from Vian Okazuki here, as he notes that unlike Kotomi and her violin, Okazuki has no goals in life, or at least he didn't before meeting Kotomi, with helping her now his goal. We've seen Okazuki experience a similar arc in Nagisa and Fuko route, as the respective girls help bring meaning into Okazuki's drab life and cause him to better himself. Case in point, we next see Okazuki forcing himself to wake up and arrive at school on time, even making a futile attempt to stay awake and pay attention in class. And this is where the anime's next episode begins, as Kotomi's screeching violin wakes Okazuki in the middle of his classroom. Kotomi attempts her intro shik to the awestruck classroom before the remaining trio of girls appear and attempt to stop her. It's here in the anime Kotomi explains she was loaned the violin, leading to Kyo performing a textbook body lock takedown to prevent her from inflicting further auditory harm, while in the VN, Okazuki literally tosses Kotomi over his shoulder as they make a break for the drama club room. In the VN, they then discuss how Kotomi has already been chided for playing in the club room, with Kotomi saying she has to play it in public because she wants Okazuki to be the first to hear it a comment which again invokes about a depression in the other girls. The anime instead skips directly to after school, with the same initial setup as the VN's last meeting, Okazuki walking in on Kyo drilling Kotomi on her retorts. The anime also moves Kotomi attempting to cast spells here, before an anime-only twist where she decides her violin playing is better than her magecraft, an action that causes anime Kyo to come to the same conclusion as her VN counterpart. Kotomi is going to have a recital, and until then, absolutely no playing in the club room. Our newly formed trio of Kotomi, Ro, and Nagisa go off to help her practice, but Kyo holds Okazuki back in both versions, noting Kotomi has become too dependent on him and needs to learn how to interact with others. Now alone, Kyo teases Okazuki, asking what they should do now that it's just the two of them, something that Tomoyo responds to by immediately falling asleep. 
Later that evening, the two walk home, and it's here we get one of my favorite Kyo moments in the entire VN. But first, let's cover the anime's much less substantial version. In both versions, Kyo complains that Okazaki spoils Kotomi too much, a comment that hits deeper in the VN due to the impact Kotomi and Okazaki's obviously developing couple dynamic is having on their remaining group of now friendzoned girls. In the anime, she then asks if Okazaki has seen anyone, and Okazaki rebuffs her saying he's a delinquent. But as Kyo points out, delinquents have an appeal to some women. This conversation is somewhat lifted from a mid-game common route discussion which takes place in the classroom with Ryo and Tsunahara, but she doesn't take it further in either version, and splits off to head home in the anime. Their VN conversation similarly focuses on romance, but it's here that Kyo actually admits defeat, and it's a confession I honestly prefer to the melodramatic ones in her namesake route. We've already seen Kyo being uncharacteristically caring, waiting for Okazuki to wake up so she can walk home with him, which sets the tone for her much more vulnerable comments here. Speaking as much to herself as Okazuki, she sighs that it was supposed to be Ryo here, not her, and that she needed to push Ryo more. Initially confused, Okazuki flashes back to Ryo running after him to return his bag and actually manages to put it together. Kyo then brings attention to the feast of food Kotomi made for them in the Vienna and how it must have taken her hours of preparation, not the sort of gesture one makes for just an acquaintance, and Okazuki admits that he hadn't thought about how much effort it was for her. It's appropriate that Kyo makes this point, as her route also involves her and Ryo making lunches for Okazuki, an apparently required part of the female clan ed character's mating ritual. Kyo openly refers to Kotomi as Okazuki's girlfriend here, even if he won't admit it, and approves of his choice, noting that despite her and Ryo being Kotomi's rivals, they couldn't help but like her. Okazaki jokes that it's a little late for Kyo to fall for him and waits for her inevitable violent retort, but none comes. And while they end up being interrupted by the main plot returning, I think he gets it. Similarly to how this route fleshes out Okazaki's relationship with Nagisa in a different, but still interesting way compared to her route, his dynamic with Kyo here is fantastic despite taking place in a different girl's route. It gives him the chance to realistically bond in shared cynical contrast to the air-headed trio, and even facilitates a unique moment of honesty and vulnerability between the characters a moment that's legitimately elevated due to not being overburdened with the melodrama or inflated stakes that comes with the big plot-defining confessions. And despite how legitimately cruel Kyo can act in the VN, this also provides her an admirable character moment as she's able to tap into her own feelings towards Okazuki not in jealousy, but to help him recognize and build his relationship with Kotomi. But unfortunately for her, this ain't Kyo's arc, with the route snapping back to focus on its titular girl as the pair suddenly runs into Kotomi being attacked by Solid Snake. This sneak attack similarly happens in the anime, but it occurs after the violin recital as the entire group walks home, with Okazuki and the twins lagging behind Nagisa and Katomi. Kyo and Ro make similar comments to Kyo's lines in the VN, but without Okazuki catching on, as the sisters discuss how they can't help but want to assist Katomi, Kyo making the odd comment that she stirs her maternal instincts. But like in the VN, their conversation is interrupted by a man appearing in the distance to confront Katomi. Although in the anime, Nagisa again proves her best girl status by throwing herself between Katomi and the stranger, before the entire squad posts up in a surprisingly tactical fashion, Kyo taking point to talk to the man like she does in the VN. Proving he is Solid Snake, the mysterious figure flees now that he's been spotted, with Katomi only being able to describe him as a bad guy. That's where the anime fades out, while in the VN Kyo consoles Katomi, making the uncomfortably realistic assumption he was attempting to sexually assault her. Katomi confirms that this wasn't the case, and that she's unharmed. Kyo then further attempts to pair the couple up and have Okazuki walk Katomi home, but Okazuki can tell Katomi still doesn't want him coming to her house, so he has her head home alone after confirming that she's not in any further danger. As a reminder though, this incident doesn't happen in the anime until AFTER Katomi's violin recital. Instead, it's the anime's turn to have a Sunday run-in with Katomi in an amalgamation of multiple VN meetings. Like in the VN's prior weekend scenario, Okazuki wakes up and sees his dad drunk at home, leading to him wandering aimlessly around town. Humorously, the anime dethrones Tsunahara as Okazuki's closest confidant, as in this version he thinks of Nagisa first when considering who'd be free to hang out with, before ultimately dismissing both options. The anime then reuses the VN's earlier scenario, and has Okazuki hear strange sounds emanating from the school, finding Katomi practicing in the library. Unlike the VN where he appreciates Katomi's dedication and wordlessly leaves, anime Okazuki enters and we get a mishmash of content from the VN's earlier library visits, as well as from Okazuki and Katomi's library date, something that of course occurs a good bit later in the VN. We first catch up on some earlier VN content, with Katomi explaining how she was given a library key due to being an honorary library assistant, and revealing she brought enough food for two, despite it being a day off. We then pivot to the library date content, as instead of a normal meal, Kotomi reveals a home-baked apple pie to split, which anime Okazuki downright goes to town on. Undeterred by his picking out, it's only now Kotomi quotes the rabbit, deer, you book lines, accompanied by some breathtaking sakuga. As I've previously mentioned, Kyoani's animation quality isn't quite at its peak with Clan Ed's first season, but it can still go incredibly hard when needed. There's a similar moment in Fukurai I forgot to mention in my last video, and both injections of maximum animation seem strategically deployed to amplify the mood of these scenes. It's also worth noting that these foreshadowing book lines are coming much later than in the VN, not that it matters a huge amount since we're still a ways off from its payoff. It's not a clear delineation, but the VN version of the route plays up the foreshadowing mystery early on the route before we get distracted with drama club shenanigans. This allows the mystery to build in the background until Kotomi's mysterious past is finally revealed in the climax. Compare this to the anime, which instead gets the drama club busy work out of the way first before slamming through the foreshadowing and payoff basically back to back, a hit to its potency but likely an efficiency measure due to the tighter time constraints. 
But at least in this case, the reshuffling does remove the nuance we talked about earlier of Katomi using this quote to test if Okazaki still remembered her, with the anime instead seemingly focused on just checking off another memorable VN moment. But either way, Okazaki clearly doesn't think too much about these random quotes, as similarly to in their VN date, Katomi reads to Okazaki after they eat, and he drifts to sleep. As he sleeps, he comes to learn that Katomi's apple pie was apparently laced as he experiences a psychedelic dream before waking up in the evening. This library date is the emotional high point in the VN, just before things come inevitably crashing down, but it plays out like just another day in the anime, with the two of them walking home and Katomi insisting she's happy Okazaki came, even if all he did was sleep. It's now we move into the recital itself in both versions. The only timeline difference so far is that the VN had the bad man appear between the recital proposal and execution, which the anime switched out for the Sunday date. The VN again highlights the positive impact Katomi is having on Okazaki's previously dysfunctional life, as he wakes up early to, like in the anime, find Nagisa's dongo-covered announcement poster. Anime Okazaki makes the appropriate connection that Nagisa could learn a thing or two from Kyo in terms of BSing approvals from the student council, while we get a couple details about the prior day's events in the VN. We learn Ryo and Nagisa return to the club room the prior day to find Kyo also asleep next to Okazaki, the two looking so peaceful the pair left them alone. We also learn Katomi again ran off when a school announcement asked her to come to the office, a recurring moment I'm still surprised never made it into the anime's narrative. In both versions, we then learn Kyo has abused her position as class president to both blackmail students into attending the recital, as well as starting a side hustle selling earplugs to said performance. She also dupes Sunahara into attending in the anime with the promise of a beautiful girl waiting for him, a duty Okazaki handles in the VN. We then get our scheduled reminder the rest of the cast still exist in the anime with way too many forest cameos. My opinion on a similar moment in Fuka route ended up softening while doing this breakdown, but here it really does start to feel extraneous. But Akio and Sane aren't even the craziest cameos here, as we get an out of nowhere moment from Misai route as Tomoyo, who Okazaki apparently invited in the anime, approaches Misai and asks for advice based on her time as the legendary student council president. Backstory the anime thought we needed to know now because... Don't get me wrong, I think it makes the anime's world feel more alive when it mixes content from between the routes, but considering Misai's arc won't be adopted until next season, its inclusion here just seems odd. But it appears the anime brought the side characters here just to suffer, as Katomi's horrendous plan begins to kill off cameos one by one, with both versions knowing the sound is worse than usual due to Katomi's nerves. Ro and Nagisa play backup on One Piece in both versions, but exclusive to the VN is the fact that Katomi's last piece was... actually good? In another foreshadowing moment, Okazaki notes it was a simple piece, but played surprisingly well, even putting him to sleep, a weirdly common reaction he seems to have in Katomi's presence. They also note in the VN that Katomi's hand is injured from practice, a sign of her dedication. This is where Solid Snake appears to accost Katomi as they walk home in the anime, while in the VN the group is able to make it home this time without incident. The next day starts uneventfully in the VN, with Katomi and Okazaki again sharing lunch alone in the library, before we return to anime-adapted content as Katomi returns the violin to Nishina and hits her with the friend script. We then get another moment in the anime that's interestingly pulled from right before the climax of the VN arc, as Okazaki, plus anime Nagisa of course, oversee Katomi venturing out of the library to sit in class, ultimately helping some classmates out with their homework before talking with them about her recital. In either case, Okazaki watches on without interrupting. Happy Katomi is opening up to others, though as is becoming my standard criticism, the significance of the moment is undercut due to it being randomly placed here. This allows the moment to pass as just another commonplace occurrence, while in the VN it's positioned as a high point in Katomi's arc towards opening up to others, which makes her immediate subsequent downturn all the more shocking and tragic. In both versions, we then see Okazaki enter in the club room, where Kyo is schooling Katomi on the harsh world of comedy as the rest of the anime girls stare up Kyo's skirt for some reason. They then break in the VN and head home, discussing how close they become despite only hanging out for a week. In the anime, they linger in the classroom a bit longer to eat, with what I think is a reference to Katomi's massive New Year's feast from the VN. We get an anime-exclusive discussion as they eat about what they do on their time off, and they conclude they're all losers who mostly stay at home. Kyo comes to the rescue, though, and decides on a group outing the next day, claiming they can't waste their youth away, a sentiment I have to assume is common in Japan due to it constantly coming up in anime, but never in my actual school life. The lead-up to this outing is a little more romantic in the VN, with Katomi explicitly asking Okazuki out on a date as they walk home, bubbling over with so much frantic excitement after Okazuki accepts that he has to repeatedly assure her of his acceptance. In the VN's timeline, however, they're going into a three-day weekend, and the date is scheduled for the second day, so VN Okazuki wakes up and loafs around for his first day off, before running into the bad guy. This meeting also happens in the anime, but it shifted so much later in the narrative it doesn't really count as foreshadowing. The conversation plays out similarly in both meetings, with the strange man introducing himself as a co-worker of Katomi's parents, and explains the totally not pseudoscience theory of a secret hidden world the Ichinoses were working on, an interesting detail which implies the flashes of the illusionary world we've been seeing, something that have disappeared by this point in the VN due to us not following Nagisa's route, aren't just symbolic or magical, but are something that can somehow be scientifically observed or predicted. We then get one of the VN's most cringe-inducing moments, when the man randomly and inappropriately asks if Okazaki is Katomi's lover, to which, if you want the good ending, you have to reply with, not yet. Fortunately, the anime makes it so this grown man doesn't speculate about high schoolers' relationships, and he instead asks if Okazaki is Katomi's classmate. The man then leaves in the anime, asking Okazaki to pass on a message, while the conversation continues in the VN with the man asking Okazaki's impression to Katomi. To which Okazaki responds that she's a little strange, but ultimately a normal girl, 
then adds on the dramatic sentiment that he wants to be with her always. Then, like in the anime, the man leaves Okazuki with a mysterious message to pass on to Kotomi, to tell her that he doesn't expect forgiveness, but that he does regret it, whatever it is. V and Okazuki then dreams of a raging fire as he sleeps, before waking, an hour after he had promised to meet Kotomi. He rushes out of the house and finds Kotomi waiting, standing still in the harsh sunlight, explaining that she didn't want to leave the exact spot Okazuki motioned for them to meet at for fear he wouldn't come. It's a neat characterizing moment of Kotomi being, well, Kotomi, while also hinting at her genuine anxiety towards Okazuki disappearing on her again. This is also where the anime picks up. You may be wondering how the anime adapted this romantic date into a group of friends hanging out, but it turns out they didn't have to, since as Kotomi reveals to Okazuki she already has a place in mind for their date, and he begins to narrow location down from somewhere in their town, to in their school, to in the library, Kyo, proving exactly why she's qualified to be Kotomi's comedy sensei, appears and lands a retort with perfect timing, lambasting Kotomi for proposing such a lame date idea with the same retort Kotomi had been repeatedly practicing. Kyo continues to berate Kotomi's date plan with some incredibly hard lines for this route, including declaring that, even if God allows it, she won't. But it's not just Kyo, the entire spurned harem appears, having stalked and overheard the couple's plans. Okazaki and Kotomi go along with this group date, assumedly out of pity, which is where the VN's narrative begins to line up with the anime's adaptation. This might be my least relevant tangent, but I also have to mention the girls' outfits, which are changed in the anime despite both versions being very early 2000s. In the VN, it's known Kotomi wears a surprisingly mature black dress, an observation the VN repeats a couple of times in what I can only assume is one of the writer's poorly disguised fetish for women that are somehow both childish and secretly DTF. She wears a less low-cut dress in the anime, which thankfully also removes Rao's white mage ass looking fit. Kyo's the only one to get a downgrade in my opinion, getting a very odd, fashionable fit, complete with a nonsensical shirt with necklace holes? Besides looking ridiculous, it seems like an overkill attempt to make her character fashionable, while in the VN, the choice to put her in a dark t-shirt and hoodie seems intentionally chosen to further characterize her couldn't care less what anyone else thinks of her personality. It also gives some proper representation to the attire most teenagers actually wear. We next move into the date, with Anime Okazuki proving that, unlike his VN counterpart, he's a real bro and calls out Sunahara's strange disappearance from this route, but Kyo turns down inviting him along as well. We then get a montage of both original moments and references to the VN's version, including a blink and you miss it shot of them eating its a whole ass scene in the VN. This involves Kyo deciding that buying a coffee gives him a free pass to eat their home-packed lunches at a local restaurant's tables. An employee is about to say something, but in the face of Kyo's unwavering confidence decides they aren't paid enough for this shit, and leaves them alone. And despite this being Okazuki and Kotomi's date, it's V and Kyo that leads the pack, while still having Okazuki pay for everything, giving Kotomi the suspect advice that a man's love can be measured by the price of the gifts he gives. This leads into him discussing gift ideas for Kotomi's upcoming birthday, including a dress and a new violin that are both outside of Okazuki's price range, before we meet back up with the anime in front of a claw machine, attempting to snag a meter-long stuffed beagle, which is changed in the anime to an equally large anteater. In both versions, a crowd is gathered as Kyo burns through Okazuki's money and repeatedly makes the arcade staff reposition the unfairly placed toy. Nagisa and Ryo try and fail in the VN, but turn down the offer in the anime before it's finally the birthday girl's turn. Or it is in the VN, but in the anime, it's time for another Fuko cameo, baby. This isn't as out of left field as you might expect. Fully completing Fuko route causes her to randomly cameo in Tomoyo arc, although to my knowledge, this incursion into Kotomi route is an anime exclusive. She looks serious, but is distracted by a starfish plush at the last moment before again disappearing into obscurity. Kotomi fares similarly in her final attempt in the VN, calculating angles, momentum, and finding the perfect location, before whiffing the grab. A gag the anime yoinks all the way into the baseball route episode in season 2. They then relax with ice cream. Ryo's treat in the VN since she alone feels bad that the gang bankrupted Okazuki. Not that she gets rewarded for it, as Vian Kotome insist on splitting her ice cream cone half seas with Okazuki in full view of everyone. Weirdly, Ryo gets an even more erotic ice cream share and scene in her sister's route, a moment I will sadly never get the opportunity to explain in this series. That's right, if you want context, you'll just have to play the VN. Either way, the mood becomes cheerful, except for Kotomi, who in both versions spaces out after seeing a plane contrail overhead, again foreshadowing the plane crash reveal. In the VN, Kyo then reveals she does possess a modicum of tact and disperses the stalkers, leading to a cute moment where, despite enjoying the group outing, both Okazuki and Kotomi decide at the same time they want a proper date tomorrow, with Kotomi admitting to what we inferred before, that she was worried when Okazuki failed to show that morning. This is where we get the proper library date which the anime half-adapted already, with the apple pie and drug-induced dream. But the anime instead has some skip foreshadowing to catch up on before the group date is over. Anime Okazuki and Kotomi also will come together, but like in a totally platonic way, she then checks off a required plot point and randomly hands Okazuki a book, saying she's already memorized the contents, but he's not to read it. This, as we later learn, is the story of the rabbit deer you line she's been quoting us from, and is a story both she and Okazuki read as kids. This gesture seems to indicate Kotomi's continuing uncertainty about if she wants Okazuki to remember her or not. She gives him the book, something that would likely remind him if he read it, but tells him not to open it, thus putting the decision on him. The bad guy then makes an anime-exclusive return, but it goes nowhere as Okazuki and Kotomi successfully pull a solid snake of their own, and he leaves. In the VN, we instead have Okazuki and Kotomi's property to cover. 
Tomoya shows up well in advance this time, and finally showing some self-awareness, physically cringes remembering him and telling the bad guy he's not Katomi's lover right now, but would like to be in the future. As he's doing this, Katomi herself appears, asking if he's experiencing a medical emergency, before you have the choice to properly ask Katomi out or not, but Okazuki ultimately chickens out either way. We then see it's not just Katomi, but the VN writers who have a love of repetition as Okazuki and Katomi have a beat-for-beat -beat repeat of their conversation about their date location, minus Kyo's well-timed retort this go-round. They sneak into the school via an open window and make their way to the library, where Katomi reveals she baked an apple pie for them, a gesture that makes a little more sense than in the anime given they'd actually planned to meet this time. You also have the choice to tell Katomi about what the bad man said, that he regrets it, but doing so will result in the bad ending, where Katomi permanently leaves school. Not telling the bad man you hope to be Katomi's lover also leads to the same bad ending, although I'm less sure what the plot justification is in that case. Otherwise, the date plays out just as their ostensibly less romantic encounter did in the anime, with Katomi reading to Okazaki until he falls asleep and has the spiked apple pie dream. After he wakes, the VN hits the same beats the anime just covered. Katomi gives Okazuki the book and tells him not to read it, and thanks Okazuki for his intervention, much more explicitly spelling out that she enjoys life more now that she's spending time with others, instead of hiding out alone in the library. The next day is another VN fluff day before both versions get to the incident. It involves Okazuki again getting up like a model student before being teased by Kyo about the date. Like in the anime, he watches Katomi make friends in class, although it's clearly more strategically positioned in the VN to follow after the date and Katomi's comment about trying to open up more. Like with Fuku route, the VN is much more intentionally building up the positivity before suddenly breaking it down. In this case, highlighting how Okazuki and Ko's friendship has helped Katomi make active steps to escape her trauma and open up to others, right before the incident is about to send it all crashing down. After that, we get some more group comedy practice in the club room, with the girls offering to join the drama club, something the anime smartly chooses to hold off on until later to use as a transition back into Nagisa route, but VN Nagisa turns them down, wanting to wait. Our only hint that status quo is about to be tragically disrupted is real fortune telling tomorrow is going to be a good day with only Kyo familiar enough with her sister's unreliable accuracy to recognize this as a bad sign. Katomi no Kazuki then walk home, hand in hand, blissfully unaware of the upcoming incident. Anime Okazuki finally dreams about the childhood fire as he sleeps, which again seems cutting it too close for foreshadowing given their backstory is going to be revealed in this very same episode. We also get a random, totally inconspicuous shot of Ryogeni on the bus in the anime, before in both versions we transition to Katomi glomping no Okazuki on his way to school. This was Kyo's suggestion, of course, more clearly fitting into V and Kyo's trend of teasing the newly formed couple to get together, which in retrospect seems to be her way of ignoring her own heartbreak. Either way, Nagisa runs up and frantically asks if Ro was taking the bus this morning, explaining there was a bad accident nearby. Kyo is visibly shaken, not helped in the VN as two male students pass by gossiping about the incident and loudly sharing clearly over-exaggerated rumors. In the VN, Ro then anticlimactically appears, explaining she was on a different bus, while in the anime they actually go down to the site of the crash where they run into Ro who gives a similar explanation. We also get a cameo in the anime of the car owner who yelled at Yoshino, who's now arguing with the bus driver, assumably having been responsible for the crash. All now seems well until Katomi suddenly collapses, sobbing and promising to no one in particular it shall be good. Kyo takes charge and gets her to the infirmary, and we cut to the end of the day where they learn Katomi left early but can't get any more information due to it being a personal matter. In the anime, Kyo and Okazuki immediately go to the teacher's office to ask for details, while in the VN, Okazuki goes alone only after Katomi fails to appear the next day. They ask for her address and the teacher gives it after cautioning them not to pressure Katomi. We then get another example of adults getting weirdly nosy in teenagers' love life, as in the VN, the teacher asks if Okazuki is going out with Katomi. Regardless of his answer, she gives some VN-only backstory about how the school let Katomi do her own thing after she was bullied by classmates, then explains that after the bus incident, Katomi accepted an offer from an overseas program to finish high school abroad. The anime brings up these details in a second conversation after their first visit to Katomi's house, but for some reason lessens the impact by making the details vague. This removes the sting this information carries in the VN, which reveals her decision has to be finalized within a week, and that, if accepted, she'd leave soon after and likely not return. In effect, sacrificing her newly formed connections and closing herself off again without sparing the gang even a word of explanation. This adds to the time pressure, and the teacher further highlights the tragedy of the situation in the VN as she explains Kotomi had just turned the offer down two days prior, lining up with her comment to Okazuki about how much happier she was now hanging out with everyone. That done, VN Okazuki runs into Kyo entering the office as he leaves. Kyo's in surprisingly high spirits, mentioning she's working on something in secret with Nagisa and Ro. Her outlook, however, stays somber in the anime, with her commenting that maybe they weren't as close friends with Katomi as they thought. In either case, Okazuki departs for Katomi's address, accompanied by the gang in the anime, while in the VN he blunders around only finding Katomi's house by nightfall, a painful reminder of the pre google Maps days. In the anime, they try the door but get no response, and give up before Okazuki returns alone, following a hunch he also gets in the VN that he always entered through the garden. And no, Okazuki isn't infected with the virus from the Cowboy Bebop movie. The butterfly leading Okazuki on at the edges of his vision is a cool anime-only visual used to depict the hunches and vague feelings he mentions getting in the VN. When anime Okazuki returns, he finds the bad man peering in, and we get an adaptation of their earlier conversation in the VN. The man similarly talks about the research he was involved with and expresses his regret, but at least Okazuki doesn't have to tell him he'd like to be her lover in the future in this version. 
That aside, both versions of Okazaki then sneak through the back garden and enter via an unlocked glass slider, with Okazaki getting flashbacks to the house in its better days as his feet somehow know exactly where to take him. He finds Kotomi alone in the floor of the upstairs study, newspapers and book clippings surrounding her, clippings that mention the late Ichinose's. It all comes back to Okazaki and we get the twist. He knew her all along from when they were kids. Kotomi remembered this the whole time, and all Okazaki can ask is why she never said anything. In both versions, Kotomi explains that at first she was happy thinking the boy from her childhood came back for her, and only later realized he'd forgotten her. This statement, as previously mentioned, puts a ton of her behavior from the start of the route into context in the VN, a little less so in the anime. She continues on, saying that despite him forgetting, she was happy Okazaki ended up befriending her anyways, and became unsure if she wanted him to remember or to just keep things as they were. Both versions then jump into a flashback from Kotomi's point of view, a much more noticeable switch in the VN given that the entire game is almost exclusively written from Okazaki's point of view. The anime speedruns the important plot points, but it's honestly one of the most finely crafted sequences in the entire VN, making phenomenal use of young Kotomi's childish point of view, as well as fantastically tone-setting background sound effects, something I don't think the VN utilizes anywhere else. We begin with Kotomi's parents explaining the meaning of her name, with Kotomi's father knowing that just because they're scientists, they shouldn't scoff at miracles or deny the beauty of the world. Unfortunately, he then loses all credibility by revealing himself as a strength theorist, telling Kotomi that the universe is made up of harps. But the anime again cuts out the part that actually informs us of Kotomi's character, as in the VN, Kotomi asks who's playing the harps, to which he responds God, probably, who's always kindly watching over us, a sentiment we'll soon see is deeply tied to Kotomi's guilt. In both versions, Kotomi's mom then steps in, giving the simpler explanation that it's a nice name spelled with three pretty hiragana, thus explaining why Kotomi introduces herself that way. Precious baby Okazaki then appears in the yard where she's practicing violin, with Kotomi's mom getting them to introduce themselves to each other. We montage over their friendship in the anime while again getting more fleshed out background on Kotomi's present day mannerisms in the VN, seeing the two kids form a ritual of Kotomi always telling Okazaki, see you tomorrow, despite his insistence that he might not come tomorrow. Kotomi then continues to explain in the VN how even back then she was ostracized by their classmates due to her intelligence, and how even as a kid she'd come to love Okazaki. In both versions, we then cut to Kotomi asking her father for a stuffed bear for her birthday, but it reveals to us she didn't really care about the bear and just knew it was popular among girls her age. But what she was really looking forward to was celebrating with her parents in Okazaki. But it wasn't to be, as her parents suddenly needed to fly out on an important research conference. They're apologetic as they leave, telling her they'll ship her a bear from the airport, but Kotomi only wanted them to stay, and yells that she hates them as they leave. The VN does explain her mom left food in the fridge and that they had a housekeeper who was supposed to arrive but got sick, but still, it seems pretty irresponsible of them to leave someone of Kotomi's age home alone for so long. There's a knock on the door the following day, but it's not her parents suddenly returning, it's a strange man. He explains to baby Kotomi that her parents' plane crashed and took them and their important research to the bottom of the sea, but there might be another copy in their study. Vian Kotomi has a heartbreaking line here where she repeatedly asks the man where her parents are, saying she needs to apologize to them for lying and saying that she hated them. But the man unfortunately sucks at communicating with kids, and results in Kotomi slamming the door on him and labeling him as a bad man looking to take her parents' research away. This is where the VN pulls out its sudden sound design props, with an incessant knocking ringing out as the narrative describes Kotomi cowering inside the house, before we hear a cutting ringing of the phone, reporters looking to get a scoop about her parents' death, creating an incessant cacophony of noise surrounding the already terrified Kotomi before she eventually snips the phone lines with her mother's scissors and makes the ringing stop. Night comes, but neither her parents nor Okazaki appear for her birthday. She eats the food her mother left out, including an apple pie, with the VN noting she still saves half of everything for Tomoya. We get an additional, heartbreakingly relatable moment in the VN as young Kotomi suddenly realizes that what remains in the refrigerator is the last of her mother's home-cooked food that she'll ever eat, and the loss finally hits her. Something about these moments just really hit me, kind of like how a place further than the universe used email notifications to make me ball. It's just such a mundane and relatable realization of loss you could imagine experiencing it in real life. But in both versions, Kotomi then looks out into the dark, empty yard and pleads to God, another moment stripped of its context in the anime due to her dad not introducing Kamisama's existence during their earlier conversation. In the VN, this is where Kotomi realizes she is fully, totally alone. No one is kindly looking over her, and she spends the next night huddled in a blanket alone at the foot of the stairs, looking out for the bad guy, who by now fully deserves that label for not calling the Japanese equivalent of CPS or something now that he knows Kotomi is likely all alone. Finally, Kotomi can't take it anymore, and we see her running from room to room looking for her parents, with the VN again elevating the moment with sound, a background of patterned footsteps and doors creaking open highlighting Kotomi's franticness as well as her aloneness in the big house. She finally reaches her father's city and sees not her parents, but a single envelope sitting on his desk. Understanding this to be her parents' important research, her thoughts again swirl, wondering how something so small could be so important, more important than her parents' life according to the bad man. But how could something so flimsy replace her parents? Convinced this must be why her parents disappeared, she burns the envelope and the flashback ends. And as we return to the present, Kotomi weakly explains that even now, she's not sure why she did it. Kotomi then explains she gathered clippings from any articles or books that mention her parents to atone for her destruction of their research, with the VN expanding that this was her way to connect with her parents after their death, Finding new information or books by them was almost like they were talking to her again, like they weren't gone forever. She further explains in the VN that this is why she started studying so diligently, to understand more and more of her parents' scientific writing, 
as well as why she cut pages from books. Her parents were so prominent she couldn't afford to purchase every text that mentioned them. But, as the anime also explains, this eventually turned into a form of penance. In burning the envelope, Katomi removed her parents' important research from the world, research no one else could recreate, so she studies an attempt to eventually rediscover it and gain God's forgiveness, a guilt that's definitely been better built up to in the VN's expanded flashback. Anime Okazuki then dips. While in the VN, he notes that nothing he says can give her the finality she craves, so simply tells her to come to school, and when Katomi bemoans she can't take it anymore, can't take being connected to people and risk loss again, he you know reverse cards her and simply leaves with a see you tomorrow. The next day, Katomi's again missing, with the anime adopting the second half of Okazuki's conversation with Katomi's teacher here, about how Katomi decided to go overseas after witnessing Ryo's near accident. Anime Okazuki then proves he's no harem protagonist, he's loyal, and we see him telling Nagusa about his return memories with Katomi. He says he's going to ditch class and visit again, with best girl anime Nagusa volunteering to go as well, but he turns her down and says she needs to stay in class. In the VN, Okazuki instead mopes through the entire day, the drama club now empty during lunch and after school, before he returns to Katomi's house alone. There's still no response to the doorbell, but this time the back door is locked as well, Katomi telling him to keep away now that she's finally gotten their secret off her chest. Anime Okazuki starts to clean up the now overgrown backyard, but VN Okazuki is about to leave defeated, when Nagisa appears in both versions, giving the excuse she skipped study hall in the anime. VN Nagisa explains she also asked the teacher for Katomi's address, and that the drama club's on hold due to a secret she's working on with Kyo and Ro. Okazuki asks for a hint, and easily figures out it's something for Katomi's birthday in both versions, but in a 180 of my previous complaints, the anime cutting down and increasing the pace of this back and forth actually helps sell the two's tighter relationship in this version. We then get another small reminder of the different timelines, as Nagisa mentions in the VN that the Founders Festival is coming up this weekend, something that obviously happened during Fuko's route in the anime. And despite being locked into another girl's route, VN Okazuki acknowledges Nagisa's best girl qualities as he notes how Nagisa willingly gave up her drama club dreams just to help Katomi. In both versions, Nagisa then insists only Okazuki can help Katomi now, but the anime obviously cutting her follow-up explanation that Katomi really likes him. It's a comment that obviously makes more sense in the VN's version of events, and VN Okazuki even notes as an honesty to Nagisa's words, but also a hint of sadness. Just like Kyo, Nagisa is willing to put her friend's best interest over her own broken heart, without even a trace of jealousy. Okazuki then explains he's going to skip school, with him returning the next day in the VN to start repairing the yard, while in the anime he begins then and there, raking the yard and weeding, eventually finding the Ichinose shed in both versions to pilfer tools from. Weirdly in the anime, his yard work consists mainly of just pulling up clumps of grass and throwing them away. I'm no yard work expert, but his actions in the VN seem much more sensical, as he explicitly mentions not having the time to sod the yard and instead attempts to trim the grass with the rusted tools he finds in the shed. We then get some cool little narrative harmony in the VN, as the player is given multiple choices to just say screw it, this isn't going to do anything. Showing Okazuki's determination as time and again we have to push through the doubt and actively choose to keep going. But in both versions, Okazuki soon realizes he's out of his depth, and leaves to read up on gardening and buy some proper tools, and while shopping runs into the trio of girls. Okazuki internally mentions in the VN he's now emptied out his bank account, money he had initially saved up in an attempt to move out from his father's house. He similarly explains this to Kyo in the anime, weirdly adding it's from his part-time job, something that is absolutely not extant in either version, unless Okazuki actually does get paid for helping his female classmates out with their unresolved issues, something which would help explain his over-the-top helpfulness in the anime. Either way, the girls explain they got permission to give Katomi the violin from school, and were on their way to get it tuned up when a scooter nearly road killed them and the violin ended up being dropped and damaged so badly the shop wouldn't even take it. Okazuki insists they try again, finally convincing the shop owner in the VN, while the anime makes a small but neat change to have the owner again refuse, forcing the gang to take a bus to the town over to try another shop. Either way, Okazuki helps calm Kyo down as the owner explains it'd be cheaper just to buy a new one, before accepting the repair by explaining it'll take months and there's no guarantee it'll sound the same. They leave, and proving I'm getting old, the anime then introduces my new choice for Clan Ad's best girl, random sleepy on the bus home salary woman. Side story win? Okazuki returns to his yard work, with the anime again making the girls seem more empathetic by having them come along as well. Kyo yells out to Katomi, and they offer to help, but Okazuki turns him down, saying he'll go home soon after. They leave, but anime Nagisa continues to display how far their relationship has progressed by returning with the sister, saying she knew Okazuki lied. Okazuki gives in and acquiesces to having them help out for a little while, sharing a cute glance with Nagisa as they work. Maybe I'm gullible, but these small interactions go so far in maintaining my investment in Nagisa and Okazuki's relationship, even as we sail through episode after episode without any progression. It just feels so real, and it's cool to see the two of them just vibing together doing unrelated stuff while still clearly being into each other, with no standard anime will-they-won't-they they bullshit or need for their relationship to substantially progress with each episode. But poor Vienno Kazuki has only his thoughts to keep him company, considering if Katomi's trauma can truly be healed and if what he's doing is worth it, before he falls asleep, alone and under the stars. The next morning, Okazuki is back at it, with the VN providing more substantial details of Okazuki's refurbishment process that covers him getting additional tools and flowers delivered to Katomi's house, instead of continuing to exclusively rip up grass for some reason. Speaking of, the girls continue to show their determination in the anime and offer to skip school as well. Okazuki turns them down, insisting that two class presidents can't go missing at the same time, but they do return after school in tracksuits, and we finally see them do something besides pulling grass as they trim the trees and repair the flowerbed. We also have another instance of the VN utilizing its medium surprisingly adeptly in this route, 
selling the restoration process better than even the anime with all its fancy animation and voice acting. Instead, the VN slowly updates the background image of the yard, restoring it piece by piece as Okazuki completes each task until it begins to mirror the pristine version we saw in Kotomi's flashback. It's a fantastic way to use the limitations of the medium to the VN's benefit, and I honestly wonder if Kotomi's route was the last the staff implemented or something because no other route uses these techniques so masterfully. On the flip side, the anime's inclusion of the rest of the gang helping out is a definite plus. The VN clearly wants to focus on just Okazuki and his relationship to Kotomi, but given how it also tries to portray Kyoro and Nagisa as caring deeply about her, it's a little plot-breaking that they just disappear once the violin repair business is concluded. As the girls go home in the anime, the true couple again proves their superiority as Nagisa stays behind, predicting Okazuki was going to work through the night, just for Okazuki to predict and proactively turn down her offer to stay and help him, claiming her dad would ban him from ever coming over again if he let her. Despite how cool it'd be to see the two of them team up, the next plot point has no place for Nagisa so she finally leaves, and in both versions Okazuki continues through the night before finally finishing, noting that only Kotomi is missing now. He sits down at the garden table, and finally takes what the book Kotomi gave him, drifting off to sleep as he reads. There's another gem of a moment here in the VN I can't help but mention is Okazuki initially thinks that this can't be the book he remembers reading with Kotomi as kids. That book was much larger, before realizing as he drifts off that no, it's just back then they were smaller. As Okazuki sleeps, the narrative pulls one of my favorite techniques, as we're now treated to the same events as in Kotomi's flashback, but now from baby Okazuki's perspective. We get some added background in the VN, explaining how Okazuki ended up lost in Kotomi's neighborhood after he and his friends were chased out of their normal hangout spot, and was drawn in by the ethereal sound of the violin into Kotomi's yard. The anime said as him chasing a butterfly he was trying to catch into their yard, fitting into the visual theme it introduced prior when Okazuki was just beginning to recall his memories in the present. We replay his meeting with Kotomi, although the anime makes an interesting narrative choice to only show her parents' face in this version of the flashback, compared to Kotomi's memory where their faces always lingered off screen. It's not directly important to the plot, but baby Okazuki makes such a retroactively obvious observation here in the VN, I'm surprised the anime removed it, as he notes his jealousy over Kotomi's doty mother, realizing that that sort of relationship was what he wanted most in the world. Okazuki's home life isn't really addressed in this route, so it's a cool if rare moment in the VN where one unrelated route provides added context onto another, since even in the more Okazuki-focused segments of Nagisa route and after story, he never really addresses how the loss of his mother affected him. The anime then cuts to baby Okazuki and Kotomi playing together, with Kotomi trying to make Okazuki eat a fake meal made of clay while they play house together in the VN, something he gets out of by insisting that they split it. half -sees. Thus, another of the rituals Kotomi has been oddly insistent on following has been explained, as well as a seemingly incomprehensible comment she made during the VN's first meeting when she clarified the food she offered Okazuki wasn't clay this time. But that's not it in the VN, as we next see her forcing Okazuki to engage in her hobby of reading advanced books, to the point that not just her, but also Okazuki had memorized the book he had just sat down to read in the present. This is why I previously theorized her quoting these words in the library was a test to see if Okazuki remembered her, since at least in the VN's continuity, we now know she knew he should recognize them. We then see them playing in the garden in both versions, with Kotomi flexing her flower identification knowledge. Her mom gently suggests they play outside, trying to get Kotomi to open up to the outside world, but she's still scared and insistent on staying within the yard. Even when announcing her birthday party in the VN, she's not at all put off that the only guest will be her parents and Okazuki. The VN follows us up with a moment that confirms even baby Kotomi is self-aware, as when they repeat their VN-only ritual of Okazuki saying he might not come tomorrow, Kotomi surprises him by answering differently, saying it's okay if he doesn't, as long as he makes it to her birthday. In both versions, Okazuki decides to bring friends as a gift for Kotomi's party, but he gets turned down by the boys in his class who are too embarrassed to go to a strange girl's party, with the VN also adding him talking to the girls in his class who only feign interest. Either way, he's dejected, too ashamed by his failure to go to Kotomi's birthday, noting in the VN that he did really like her. But the guilt builds, and at midnight he returns to hear sobbing as he finds Kotomi surrounded by flames, trying in vain to put out the blaze with cups of water before adults burst into the room and put out the fire, using a proper fire extinguisher in the VN or just their coats in the anime. The bad man then looks at the burnt paper, only saying that it wasn't it. Okazuki never saw Kotomi again after that, and he notes that over time he forgot the entire affair until it seemed like a dream. We flash to a vision of baby Kotomi at their first meeting in both versions, before Okazuki forces himself awake and finds Kotomi still standing there, now in the present. She asks if he's awake, her face happy now, and Okazuki comments he might still be dreaming. Kotomi explains she always remember that boy, that she really, really liked him, and she's been waiting for him this entire time, just to be dumped and relegated to a bit part in the anime's version, but let's ignore that for now. Okazuki then begins to recite the book lines back at Kotomi, but in the VN, he doesn't begin with the rabbit deer you line, he begins at the start of the passage, signaling to Kotomi that he really has remembered now, and they continue to recite the story at each other line by line. The full story chronicles the meaning of a man and a young time traveler, and they continue until they get to the rabbit deer you line. And for your daily fun fact, these lines are from a real book, The Dandelion Girl by Robert F. Young, which I totally didn't just learn by looking at Wikipedia. Okazuki then offers Kotomi his hand, he's here to take her back, to where everyone's waiting. But something's not quite right, as Kotomi clutches her face in pain. Okazuki may have returned the garden to its prior state, but the clock still can't be turned back now. They're both older and her parents aren't coming back. 
Nothing can undo what's already been done, and mowing some grass isn't enough to fix a decade of trauma. Or at least it is in the VN, because for some inane reason, the anime actually rolls with this fake-out happy ending. That's right, the VN created a gotcha moment to show how doing some lawn care and a couple kind gestures isn't enough to magically fix someone's trauma, and the anime was like, yeah, actually it does sound about right, let's go with that. Instead of being cured, VN Kotomi begins to let her brutally raw feelings out, that the world's wrong for taking her parents away from her, that even now she asks why she was the one left behind. Why couldn't she have gone with them, sunk alongside them into the depths of oblivion? Not able to stand her words any longer, Okazuki embraces her, saying that it's just too sad to hear, that he loves her, and that he'd be sad if she was gone. But surprisingly, not even the MC's confession is enough to console Kotomi, as she admits she too loves him, but she's now learned that her love alone can't stop someone from leaving her, from forcing her through the same pain her parents' death left her with. Okazuki can't deny that, but plays the goofy yet sincere angle of promising to be with her regardless. The even if he passes on, he'll stay beside her, wordlessly watching over her from beyond. I don't know if it's a Japanese thing or a dramatic romance story thing, but this line, of promising to be with someone forever, comes up a couple times in Clan Ed, most dramatically during After Story. And remember when I said my opinions on 2000s era fashion was going to be the least relevant tangent of this video? Well, I lied, because I want to briefly talk about how this line's always fascinated me. It's such an over-the-top sentiment that's always said sincerely, even as both parties are fully aware of its impossibility. I mean, the oldest usage of this line I know of is from the Big J himself, and in that context it is supposed to be taken literally. The reader is supposed to have faith he can actually deliver on this impossible promise. But for the rest of us, it's a statement somehow made more sincere because of its absurd impossibility. And because of that, it's a sentiment that, in my opinion, works as a mostly satisfying conclusion to Katomi's trauma in this arc, to the existential loneliness and guilt we see her develop during her childhood. It might not be a perfect depiction of mental health, but it's a certainly more believable resolution than just having Katomi jump from debilitating breakdown to totally fine just by having her garden fixed up. But regardless of how it was resolved, Katomi now has the strength to venture carefully back outside, accepting that life is worth living despite the inevitability of loss. In the VN they kiss, then sit together in the garden like when they were kids, before in both versions Katomi finally steps outside the garden walls again and admires the beauty of the sky under a setting sun. We then cut to the next morning, with Okazuki in his spurned hair and waiting for Katomi to arrive. The gang gives her a certificate for the repaired violin as a birthday present, complete with a cute VN-only interaction where Katomi focuses in on Nagisa's Dongu illustrations until Kyo is forced to bring her attention to the violin part. That's the whole scene in the anime, but the VN again actually addresses the specifics of Katomi's trauma as she explains her prior breakdown to the group, and how even considering the loss of a loved one brings her physical disorientation. We then get a second round of sappy but sincere consolations in the VN, as Kyo continues to throw down surprisingly hard lines, promising that even if she and Ro died, they wouldn't forget Katomi. This leads to them promising in turn to haunt Katomi as ghost even if they do die before her, with Kyo declaring that she'll beat up any nearby evil spirits, while Ro and Nagisa can't go that far, just saying they act more as moral support ghosts. Katomi laughs, noting that Okazuki said the exact same thing, right before they kiss. She cuts herself off, but it's too late, and the twins shoot daggers at Okazuki, before Kyo plans a karaoke visit after school to interrogate Katomi, bad cop, timid cop style. But with that boring character and thematic development out of the way, the anime finally rejoins the narrative so they can get back to checking off plot points, as a teacher suddenly runs up, telling Katomi her legal guardian, the bad man, is visiting and urgently needs to talk. This was why Katomi previously skipped town any time there was an announcement come to the office in the VN, but with the gang support she's finally ready to face him, as Kyo uses a surprisingly polite tone to convince the teacher to let them all be there when they meet, and to do it in the drama club. They arrive in the room, where our old snake lookalike presents Katomi with her father's metal briefcase, explaining it had recently washed up from the plane crash. Is the missing research paper inside? He doesn't say, and prompts Katomi to open it. Inside there's no paper, just a short note and a stuffed bear? Both versions of the narrative are about to get into sappy territory, but honestly, this was all that was needed. Like with Katomi realizing she was eating the last of her mother's home-cooked meals, or the emails in Yorimoi, it's a moment made all the more emotional by the mundanity of it. As the plane went down, not knowing what they'd be able to take with or if they'd even survive, Katomi's parents tossed their world-changing research aside and stuffed this gift bear inside their metal case baggage. Because to them, that was what mattered most. Just as Katomi lamented that a piece of paper couldn't possibly be more important than her parents' wives, Katomi's parents valued a last kind gesture to their daughter over the chance of preserving their legacy-defining world-changing paper. In this moment, the other half of Katomi's trauma is finally resolved, affirming her childhood angst over her parents missing her birthday was just that, and that her parents really did care more about her than their research. She has no reason to feel guilty. The bad man reaffirms this further, telling Katomi that it wasn't even a copy of their research she burned. There never was a copy. Inside the envelope was a gift catalog of stuffed bears. That's what her father was working on right up to when he had to leave for his flight. He continues to tell her how happy her dad sounded when they talked about it, as well as providing the slightly too convenient excuse that he didn't clarify sooner because he didn't think she'd believe him. But the burned research isn't the only burden that's lifted off Katomi's shoulders. A piece of her parents has finally returned. Her last words to them no longer have to be, I hate you. She holds the bear close and begins catching them up on everything that's happened since they left, going into heart-wrenching detail in the VN, ending by saying that they don't need to worry anymore since she's no longer alone. She's very happy now, and she welcomes him home. Even VN Okazuki admits to crying uncontrollably. It's another fantastically believable expression of tragedy and loss that just gets me. 
but the writers apparently didn't think it was enough, and sour the moment by absolutely milking the snot out of this scenario, as in both versions there's not only a bear, but a note bearing both Ichinose's signatures. This note goes on for paragraphs, explaining the bear and wishing Kotomi the best, thus making the moment less mundanely believable by turning her parents' metaphorical last words into literal ones, as well as straining the credulity of the moment by depicting Kotomi's parents as such measured badasses they were able to write half an essay, in commonly written print, to their daughter while the plane was crashing, somehow knowing it was going to be fatal the entire time and their time wouldn't be better spent by grabbing their life jackets or something. It's just overwrought and turns an admittedly unrealistic but still believably frantic gesture of a parent's love into a whole ordeal, something that isn't helped by the second half of the letter written in English. Ryo proves she's the second smartest as she begins to translate for the group before Katomi reads it, explaining that it's a request for the recipient to get the suitcase to their daughter. We then get a montage of the suitcase being carried country to country, as despite writing half an essay that Ichinose has apparently ran out of time to scribble down their home address. The bad man even notes he had an acquaintance test some of the dirt on the box and found it was from Africa, something he apparently had time to do despite this meeting being so urgent it had to take place today. We then get an overblown, and unskippable, montage in the VN of the parents' request read in different languages, copied in the anime by a montage of it traveling through an insane bevy of countries as the suitcase moves from France to Egypt to the Netherlands to the Aegeans for some reason, then to India, Tehran, back to Portugal, and then to the Arctic? It's a moment that further strains credulity and distracts from the relatable emotional moment between Katomi and her late parents that the entire route had been building to, just to interject some cliché goodness of humanity message that comes out of nowhere. Making this even more hilarious is the fact that the English dub forgot, or couldn't afford, to record the lines being said in different languages. Not sure how that happens, since they could have just reused the audio from the sub, and gives us nearly a minute of wordless scenery montage. We then hear the contents of the Ichinose's unbelievably long and detailed letter to Katomi, as both versions montage over prior moments from the route, before we see a ball of light appear in the anime and cut to the bear now sitting in Katomi's yard. She waits in her garden, now wearing a white dress in both versions, probably symbolic or something given her dark gray attire in the VN. In the VN, two of the same heights plays, a background track I only just realized was used for the basis of the second season's OP. We then see Kyo and Okatsuki arrive with Katomi's repaired violin in the VN, explain the rest are out shopping and will arrive soon. While in the anime, the entire gang is there and mentions Sunahara, Yukane, and Nagisa's parents will also be arriving soon. But it's not just the anime inviting a ton of unrelated guests, as Kyo explains in both versions she's blackmailed a bunch of students to attend, with the VN further explaining that they're the poor sod she drafted violin repair funds from. Katomi smiles, saying it's okay. Her parents' house is a big yard. Symbolically showing she's now ready to let others into her life. Our final shot is of the bear and violin sitting on the garden chair, with the VN further zooming in on a note the gang left attached to the violin from all of them to Katomi, saying it sounds better than before. Given the other content of this route, I don't think this is a crack theory, but it was only in my final play today that I realized this final image is probably supposed to be read as a metaphor for Katomi herself. Just like with Katomi, it wasn't going to be easy to fix the violin, and it might seem simpler to just move on and find another. But the cast couldn't just throw away and replace the broken instrument because of what it meant to them, and they pushed on until it was repaired even though there was no guarantee that it could be fixed or that it'd be the same as before it was broken. But just like the final note on the violin says, it was worth it, and while Katomi may not be the same person they initially met when she was still repressing her trauma, she ultimately came out the other side better off for it. And that's it for the route. Katomi and Okazuki assumedly live happily ever after in the VN, while in the anime, the childhood friend she finally reunited with is about to ditch her and return to some much better adapted content in Nagisa route. But that's not quite it for this video, since as you may have guessed, I have some thoughts on this one. But before giving my overall impressions, I want to highlight one aspect of Katomi's character that was impacted by the anime's cuts. That's right, it's time for another absurdly long tangent on a topic I'm absolutely unqualified to speak about. And by that, I mean it's not exactly controversial to suggest Katomi is intended to be read as autistic, right? I mean, I wouldn't be the first person to suggest half of Clannad's cast be read as neurodivergent in some way. Ryo, Nagisa, and Fuko all struggle to hold normal conversations unless it's about their special interest of fortune-telling dongos and starfish respectively. Similarly, Nagisa, Fuko, and even Tomoyo have moments showing almost unbelievable levels of ignorance towards standard social cues or conventions. While I think these can all be valid readings, they're not particularly explicit about it, and could be equally read as just social awkwardness or immaturity, but with Katomi, the characterization seems much more explicit. Now to be clear, everything I'm about to bring up is in terms of common understanding and the traits media uses to signify autistic and neurodivergent individuals. I'm absolutely not making any claims about whether these traits are actually accurate or relatable to individuals' lived experience, just trying to interpret what the text is attempting to signify. To start, Katomi is clearly cast into the antisocial genius role common to depictions of autistic individuals, being both abnormally talented and diligent when it comes to academics, but struggling to figure out social cues or behavior, instead preferring to be on her own or with only a few close friends. We also see her invest in maintaining outwardly pointless routines or patterns, such as her absolute insistence on splitting everything half used with Okazuki, or saying see you tomorrow to each person individually every single time they part, showing discomfort when these patterns are broken and even becoming non-verbal when particularly stressed or overstimulated. All these traits go beyond the standard anime-ishness many characters in Clan and in other shows display, and seem to be intentionally chosen to code her as autistic, or at least neurodivergent in some way. 
So what's my point going into all this? Well, whether these traits are an accurate depiction of autism or not, they're a significant and unique aspect of Katomi's character in the VN that separates her from other characters in the game and the anime at large. But something interesting happens when the anime compresses the route's timeline. None of these aspects are necessarily changed, and most are even referenced, but there isn't enough time for them to come off as anything more than gags instead of as significant aspects of Katomi's personality. There certainly isn't time in the anime to have Katomi individually send off each member of the drama club every single day, so it can't communicate this is a specific ritual that's important to her. We don't get to see how seriously she takes her seemingly idiosyncratic act of splitting everything half season for Kazuki because the moments where she insists on splitting even non-splittable foods are gone. Even her social skills have been improved in the anime, as it had to increase the pace of conversations where Katomi originally spent more time struggling to communicate with the wider cast. These aren't massive changes, and Katomi's anime incarnation certainly isn't unrecognizable compared to the VN, but it's an example of how, especially for this route, our understanding of the underlying characters and themes of the route are impacted simply by how much the anime compresses the content. Similarly, while the VN's most memorable moments, the flashbacks, the date in the library, quoting from the dandelion girl, still exist in the anime, many end up stripped of their meaning because of how quickly the anime rushes through them. The worst offender of this is clearly the ending, with any exploration to the cause and nature of Katomi's trauma skipped over just to have her get better as soon as the main character shows up making her serious-looking breakdown read not as a believable reaction to trauma, but as a plot device used to inject conflict into the route until we hit the episode count where it can disappear just as suddenly without further mention. And while none of these changes individually is a massive hit to the anime's quality, combined it leads to a narrative that checks off all the plot points and iconic moments from the VN, but the meaning, the character arcs, the themes, all the meaty parts that can make a good story great, end up left behind. And I'd honestly be interested to know if these cuts were due to time issues, the anime staff not being interested in Katomi's route, or if they simply couldn't think of a way to integrate Okazuki's romantic unavailability into this version of the route. Because I have a lot of sympathy for the anime staff in this regard. Unlike Fuko's route, Katomi's arc is squarely focused on Katomi and Okazuki's budding relationship, with a narratively significant part of the ending involving Okazuki promising to stay with her forever, something I don't think anime Nagisa would let fly throughout After Story. Maybe there isn't a good way for the anime to dive deeper into Katomi's trauma without Okazuki coming off like a total flake, given he's absolutely going to ditch her again with Katomi's anime fate actually matching the VN's bad ending with her traveling alone to America to study after graduation. Honestly, I don't have any great ideas for how the anime could have reconciled these two conflicting conclusions. Kyo, Ro, and Nagisa make similar promises to watch after Katomi forever in the VN without any romantic undertones, so maybe the anime could have done something similar by making it a promise the friend group gives at once? But that doesn't help resolve Okazuki's childhood connection with Katomi, an element that's essential to the route's plot in both versions despite how little impact it actually has on the anime's narrative going forward across the remaining seasons. As much as I hate to say it, maybe the anime's best option would have been not to adapt this route at all given how tight it is for time. I mean, the anime doesn't give us even a single episode between Nagisa and Okazuki first moving in together in After Story and Nagisa's pregnancy, despite novels worth of cut content occurring between those moments in the VN. If we're talking about the overall quality of the anime, might not have that been a better use of their limited episode count? On the other hand, Kotomi is a fantastic character, and she still has a ton of great moments that the anime does adapt, but there had to be a better way to incorporate her without using a whole fourth of the season's runtime if they didn't feel they had enough time or writing flexibility to properly flesh out her route. Ultimately though, despite my harsh criticism, Katomi's episodes aren't terrible, just painfully average. When I previously analyzed Fuko's route, I came away with a newfound respect for both versions, but while Katomi's VN route mesmerized me with its characters and writing, I can't help but see the anime version is mostly unremarkable. Considering the anime pivots into its concluding arc right after this, it can't help but feel like they're just killing time in order to hit an episode count, something that isn't helped by how inelegantly this route slots into the anime's timeline. I mean, Okazuki and Nagisa have literally gathered plenty of potential members for the drama club, but instead of continuing to pursue Nagisa's dream, which had been so important for Okazuki before, they kind of just vibe around for a few episodes. Delaying Nagisa's arc made sense in Fuko's route due to the urgency of her supernatural condition, but we don't get a similarly convincing excuse as to why our main couple isn't more focused on the drama club during the intro to this route. If anything, Okazuki comes off as flaky for ditching Nagisa to help a stranger make friends, and it's similarly weird how despite his deep childhood history with Katomi that's so central to this arc, Okazuki shows no real emotional attachment towards her as soon as this route ends. If nothing else, I guess it means unlike the VN, the anime fulfills the trope of the childhood friend always losing. And if it feels like I've only been complaining about the anime for the last hour and a half, it's only because Katomi's route in the VN is so well done. It's not my favorite, Nagisa's earns that honor for me, but based on the quality of its writing and presentation, I'd easily consider it the best out of all the VN's routes. It's a testament to the writing that Katomi's emotional art can take on added nuance in a second playthrough, and her flashback sequence easily sets the most vivid tone out of anything in the VN. And despite it not being their route, Nagisa, Kyo, and Ro all get great moments as well, a rarity considering the usually limited side cast of the VN's arcs. I easily prefer Kyo's pseudo-confession here compared to the over-the-top melodrama we get in her route, and I love the development Nagisa gets in this route, showing she isn't totally helpless without Okazuki doting on her. These moments highlight the narrative strengths of the VN's format more than almost anywhere else, giving us great moments and insights into these side characters by letting them breathe in different roles and scenarios that just wouldn't be possible if the VN used only a single cohesive timeline. This livelier version of the drama club compared to Inagisa's route is also a treat, and the anime deserves credit for running with this setup as it moves into concluding her route. 
Speaking of, we also need to throw the anime some praise for how well it takes advantage of its medium, as well as the deep understanding it continues to show towards its characters. Well, at least the ones not named Katomi. We get some small moments, namely with Kyo and Ro, which are able to convey emotions and tone that the VN takes paragraphs of dialogue to explain, and communicates it to us in an instant, managing to be simultaneously subtle and immediately understandable in a way that only a visual medium can. And although the wider cast was originally present in this route, the anime continues its trend of increasing their screen time in smart ways, such as having the rest of the girls help out with Katomi's yard work and continue to check in on her instead of completely disappearing after dropping the violin off for repairs. Basically, the anime continues to display the same strengths and weaknesses they've repeatedly brought up when discussing the intro and Fuko routes. It's just that Kotomi's arc is the first time where the balance shifts from being good in different ways to noticeably less polished, at least by my measure. And trust me, this won't be the last time I complain about the anime making cuts to the Vion's nuance of themes, but no arc, in my opinion, suffers as poorly as Kotomi's in this regard. That's not to say the side routes adapted later aren't even more rushed, but at least they have the decency to only take up two or three episodes. The placement of this route also doesn't do any favors, with Okazuki and Nagisa's relationship, the driving plotline for the entire season and the arc we were initially sold on, now having been on hold for two entire unrelated arcs. Not even a couple of cute glances are enough to distract from the fact that they've gone 10 episodes without any development. But that's all for Katomi Route, one of Clanid's most unique characters and in my opinion one of the VN's biggest hidden gems. Fortunately, I'll have much more positive things to say about the anime during my next episode, as Nagisa's plotline finally defrosts from his cryosleep. And also to look forward to next time as a breakdown of the anime's unique concoction as we dive into a mini-arc not present in the VN, made from a mix of characters and plotlines from across Clanid's remaining unadapted routes, as well as some of the anime's added special sauce. So start counting down the years until my next release to discover just how long these videos can stretch as I have to discuss all of Clanad's nine remaining episodes and we get agonizingly close to wrapping up the arc of our very own theater club president.